it's it's January. Like this shouldn't be happening right now. This is not what what are you talking about? And we just checked our math over and over and over again. And we're like, what did we miss? What did we miss? How is this happening? And eventually it was just like, we didn't miss anything. This baby's just coming now too early. So ready or not, here we go. The moment I saw the baby on the ground and moving, I called our other keeper who lives the closest to the zoo, um, Dan, and just said, the baby's out and it's alive. Get to the zoo. I had to uh, kind of gather my thoughts a little bit. It's not what you're expecting to see. Um, at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, hippos normally give birth in the water, so the fact that she was on land was kind of interesting. Um, and she was tiny, she was trying to get up. There was a whole wave of emotions. Uh, one, the first one was that she was so small. And amazement that she, she was warm and she was looking at, like, I mean, she was pretty with it for being a newborn calf. And she just looked so tiny just way too small and like nobody saw her and felt good about it. I just remember being excited but really, really hesitant and like guarded because I, I didn't really think she would survive, but it was so cool that she was alive. So then the vets came in and we kind of um, got her temperature, did a quick check of her. She was colder, she was weaker, and that's when we decided to, uh, to pull her. And since I had picked her up the first time, like I could appreciate how much colder she was. So she had declined in her responsiveness really quickly, like in 30 minutes. If we wanted her to survive, it was gonna take serious intervention. We're like, all right, I guess we're raising this baby. By the time I got there, we knew she was alive. There were no congenital deformities. Um, all, by all standards, she was looking pretty good for starting where she was that early in life. So it really was a case of our team jumping in, refusing to give up, and saying, listen, we're going to create an intensive care unit that this baby is going to make it. She didn't look like a normal baby should look, obviously. When you're born that early, um, her color wasn't great. Um, she was obviously very lethargic, not moving like she should, not as active, um, and she was still pretty cold by the time I arrived as well. Since she was cooling down, we had to get her, our priority was to get her as warm as possible or to warm back up. Um, and we immediately had her wrapped up in blankets and had people laying with her to get her temperature up. We were spending a lot of time in a 98 degree room, sweating and, you know, trying to make sure that she's still breathing. Just not a lot of energy, not able to support her weight, so this will all take time and hopefully everything turns out well. Six weeks is pretty early. And nursery staff, Don, who's great, was trying to see if she would start to nurse a little bit, so we were trying to get some some Pedialyte into her. There's just basic care that all mammals need. So we wanted to know, was she able to breathe? Was her heart okay? Um, those were where we started. We also drew blood on her pretty quickly to see her overall picture. There's a lot of basic stuff that you do in the beginning just to see if the animal has the ability to survive. So we knew that she needed to have moisture on her skin. She would typically be born in the water. Hippos, for the most part, give birth in the water and then they spend you know, 16 hours a day in the water, so we knew it was really important for her to stay wet. We had to keep IVs in her, which she has to be dry to have an IV in her leg, yet she needs to be wet all the time because her skin will dry out and it causes dehydration and other problems. So we had to come up with ways to keep her dry and yet keep her moist all at the same time. I think I had to work out or reach out to an orphanage in Africa, a rhino orphanage, that had some experience with hippos and they kind of recommended some lotion that they used that seemed to work well on hippo skin. And then it just gets more and more complicated. Because oddly enough, those first day or two, you're, you're just trying to assess if the animal can survive and keep it alive. But then it's like, okay, well it can. How do we keep it alive now? I mean, we had aquatics coming in, trying to help set stuff up for this makeshift hippo nursery that we were trying to um, put together. Um, maintenance was helping out, vet staff, nursery. Um, the entire Africa staff was doing everything that they could because um, everyone wanted to make sure she was okay and be involved, but we also had the entire rest of the collection to take care of. So it was a, it was a real team effort to try and get everything under control. Eventually she was put on oxygen and we had to make sure that this thing that's made for human noses is staying in a hippo nose. The main focus the first was just keeping her, keeping her stable. Any little change that happened with her <laughs> texting or calling the vet staff to 
see if it was normal at all, out, <laughs> all hours of the night. She was premature in every sense of the word, so she wasn't ready to be out in the world. So she wasn't ready to thermoregulate. Um, she had no suckling response, so she wasn't ready to feed herself. Um, and her lungs weren't totally developed um, in a way that would allow her to act like a normal hippo. So that was our first big hurdle, was keeping her warm and getting her temperature up to the 98 to 100 degree range, which is normal for a hippo. And that took several days, and, and we got that conquered. Um, we were able to use a tube to feed her directly into her stomach. It's exactly what needed to be done, and I understand that, but it was not fun to watch, and I would hold my breath the entire time. It was about two and a half weeks that we tube fed her. And initially she wouldn't digest that food, so we had to do a lot of tweaking with that. We had the formula figured out by really within the first uh, week to 10 days, but really within the first week we had a basic formula. We just had to tweak it a little bit down the road. And she started digesting the food, so that was great. A little over a week of age, almost two weeks of age, when she really started getting strong enough to be able to take in pretty good volumes from the bottle. But it was uh, two to three weeks before we were able to stop tube feeding her. And then she started holding her breath, which was terrifying. And she would not open her nostrils. She was closing her nostrils and she wasn't moving. And it, it went on for minutes. I was starting to kind of freak out. Hippos have a dive reflex, which allows them to stay underwater. An adult hippo can stay underwater for about five minutes. Calves can be born in the water because they can hold their breath for about 30 seconds when they're born. And Fiona, in her uh, sleep, started holding her breath, which we can only assume was her practicing that dive reflex. So it was a couple seconds from calling the vets, and she finally opened her nostrils and took a breath. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't handle much more of this. Like, please never do that again. Aside from terrifying us and looking like she had died and wasn't breathing anymore, even when she would start breathing again, um, her, her blood values and her general demeanor was diminishing. It was very hypoxic, her, her, meaning her tissues didn't have the, the oxygen they needed, and she would um, get weaker and weaker throughout the day. Um, so we had to figure out a way to get her to try to stop doing that, or at least do it less often, which our um, head neonatal keeper, Dawn, had the idea of, well, a baby hippo would be laying on her mom, so let's lay her on us and let her feel us breathing so she knows to keep taking normal breaths. She actually started getting energy. Um, she started to have a suckling response so she could take her own bottle. It wasn't long after that that I think she stood for the first time overnight when she was with Teresa. Teresa sent that video image out to all of us and like <laughs> wobbly little Fiona like trying to walk around for the first time. She was just so wobbly and she was so small at the time. Once she was strong enough to be able to walk then you got this extra sense of hope where, okay, now, now she's, you know, she obviously made a progression. I don't, I don't want to get too excited, but this is adorable and amazing. So that for me was a big turning point where I, instead of just like being like, we might pull this off. That's when I started finally like daring to believe that we could. Definitely once she started to get a little bit more mobile, that was a blessing and a curse as far as trying to keep the catheter and everything in her that she needed. She would fight back more with the tube feeding. Um, so she was looking a lot like a very tiny but normal hippo developing the way we would like to see. Um, and then she started teething. And then she was in so much pain, we believe, she stopped wanting to nurse. And then, of course, she's not getting nutrients and became dehydrated. Her mouth hurt. She didn't want to eat at all. So even with tube feeding, she became much more lethargic. Her blood work was showing some a little bit of signs that were a little bit concerning. Nothing that showed infection or anything horrible, but she just, um, we knew we needed some extra help basically at that point. She wasn't, she wasn't clicking along when she had been um, in the days prior to that, and um, we needed to get a little bit more aggressive with her therapy. Because she was so dehydrated, her veins were even harder to find. Um, so eventually, uh, they would find a vein and get a catheter in to keep the IV drip in and either she would move or it was just too weak of a vein for the catheter to work. The catheter would break and we couldn't keep an IV in her. She dehydrated so quickly and then it was just racing against the clock to try and get fluids into her. So we were trying everything we knew to keep her hydrated and just really nothing was working and she was declining quickly. We knew we needed a long-term um, IV catheter. That is what she needed to save her life at that point. One of the staff here at the, um, on the PR team 
actually had um, her own experience with the vascular access unit. So the Cincinnati Children's Hospital um, came and they had all the special equipment and are used to working with all of the premature NICU babies. That's something that our vascular access team does every day, 24 seven, placing vascular access devices. It might be an IV or a PIC or managing complications on all different size patients. We had uh, packed up a big bag of different supplies that we thought would work well for an animal, you know, just trying to keep this in. Um, and we came down and did our thing. They use ultrasound to find the veins that are deeper in the body. And not knowing, you know, do they, is it you know, thick skinned or do we have any hair? You know, are we gonna be able to even visualize a vein? And so they came over very graciously, um, really within about an hour of calling them, they were here and they used the ultrasound and found some deep veins in her leg and were able to place uh, a more permanent catheter for it. One of the challenges was after placing it is really securing it. So what are we going to do next? Um, so we brought a lot of different um, products over to actually secure it and then tape it really well also. Thank God they came when they did because I was going on my, my weekend when this all happened and I was literally saying my goodbyes and then to see her decline like that so sharply. And I mean, we really didn't know from moment to moment if she was gonna stay with us. Once they had it set up, it lasted for four days and she just perked right back up after four days. But that was very, that was the scariest time. I think without their help, we would not have Fiona today. So I do believe um, Children's Hospital, there's so many other things that went into Fiona and there are so many things that could have gone wrong if our vet staff or you know, nursery care staff hadn't um, done what they had done, but one of the points in Fiona's life where she would not have survived was when she was no longer taking her bottle and we could not keep an IV in her. So I do believe that the Children's Hospital staff is responsible for saving her life at least one of the many times that she needed it. So we were so uh, pleased to be really a part of the Cincinnati Zoo's history for baby Fiona. It's a good feeling to be able to help our zoo in Cincinnati because I think she's just brought such joy to everybody in, in Cincinnati. Everybody loves her. It worked out and succeeded and then after that she was just on the path to become a normal little hippo. I knew it was serious at the time but at the same time um, it was just you have a job to do, don't think about she's, she's going to die or she's going to make it, just go day to day to day, don't think down the road too much, let's get through this problem. and. Um, Everything works out, you get to the next problem. Everything works out, you get to the next problem. You just um, tackle it one day at a time, and it's not quite so overwhelming when you approach it from that standpoint. You always try to keep in the back of your mind that things could go wrong, um, but we did everything that we could, constantly collaborating and talking things out. You know, one of the neat things about Fiona and the, the big task of saving her initially and then raising her it really was all hands on deck. All kinds of people got involved. Well, Cincinnati is, I think, remarkable for its community and how, I mean, it's a city. It's a major city and it acts like a small town. Everyone comes together um, and will do anything that's needed for each other. So it was unique for Children's Hospital to come over, but also very normal in the Cincinnati context of like, they're our neighbors and they helped us out. Fiona's taught us along the way too, she really has, about not giving up and uh, that sometimes, you know, uh, that much love and concern can save the day. I've never seen anything quite like what's happened through Fiona's entire journey. Um, if we need anything from anyone, they pretty much would drop what they, what they were doing and come and help out. And this is the element of Fiona's story that I actually love more than anything is that we were willing to take this leap of faith and, and just be honest, like right from day one, minute one, here's what happened. We had a baby, it's way too small, it may not make it, here's what we're doing, we're hoping for the best, and um, just kind of putting it all out there. And I think the hope was that people would see that transparency and see everything we were doing for her and ultimately be supportive and understanding no matter how it turned out. And we got that like a hundredfold. I mean, people were so amazing and so supportive, and that really helped a lot. It was so nice to just have all that overwhelming love and support and encouragement and 
That's what got us through the really tough times, I think, more than anything. Once you got past that intensive care unit phase, you know, if you look back, Fiona launched from there. Nature's built to be resilient and to live. And, you know, she's shown us how strong a hippo can be.